So we're going to have uh, Ross Crosby, uh, our technical director, um, in this particular session. He's going to provide some insight into his job and what he does at Seattle Opera, a little bit about his background and um, some behind the scenes stories of preparing particular operas. So like I said, we'll hold for just a few more minutes and then we'll get started. How's that sound, Caroline? Well, again, welcome everyone. Ross, you might want to uh, take off your mute. And uh, I'd like to uh, introduce Ross Crosby. He is our technical director. My name is Glenn Hare and I am the senior communications manager at Seattle Opera. Um, I've been with the company almost two years, but Ross, you are, um, I think just about a year into being the technical director at Seattle Opera. I think you came in right when we moved into the new building. That's right, I did. I just in January of 2019 was my first day. I actually, my, technically my first day was New Year's Day, but it was a day off, so I got <laughs> That's I a started a holiday. Start. Yeah, uh, first let me say it's really nice to meet everybody virtually and to see so many people's faces and certainly to see some of my colleagues' faces. I don't we miss being in the same room and in the same building together. And it's nice to meet uh, virtually so many other people. I'm excited a lot of people came. I wasn't, <laughs> maybe nobody would show up, so. <laughs> Russ, tell us a little bit about your background, how you came to Seattle Opera. How I came to Seattle, uh, let's see. Uh, well, I was um, raised by theater folks and artists. My father's a musician and my mom's an arts administrator and a director and all kinds of things. So I was sort of dipped in uh, the performing arts early uh, and ended up, I went to college. I went to George Washington University in DC and I majored in theater, technical theater and design and left DC and I worked in New York City for a number of years doing lighting design assisting work and I did some uh, tech work on Broadway, things like that, moved back to Washington DC, continued to work. And then um, my wife, Rachel, is, has family out here in Seattle and we decided together to move to Seattle in 2015. Uh, and we did that and uh, I started working for the Seattle Opera in January of 2019. When I first moved out here, I, I did some other work. I worked for a museum design company as a production manager. And uh, then I saw that this position was open and I thought it was an amazing opportunity to get to work on the projects. I mean, Seattle Opera has a national reputation as being an excellent company and I was thrilled with the opportunity to work here. So now I've been here at the opera almost a year and a half. Uh, and I live here uh, with Rachel and my brand new baby daughter, Lydia. Oh, well, congratulations on the new baby. Thank you. Great. Thank um, you. So tell me, what, tell us, what, what does a technical director do? It's kind of a vague kind of job title, but I'm sure yeah. you have specific things that you do. That's a good question. Um, what I do, uh, I'm responsible for, I supervise the five of the backstage technical departments, uh, basically. So the scenery, the scenic department, lighting, uh, audio, video, if we have video for the, any particular production, and what we call the prop department, which mm -hmm. these props are anything that singers or performers touch and handle that doesn't fall under the costume department. And it also covers things like furniture. So no. physical items, anything that the performers aren't touching or wearing that create the world of the opera or the mm -hmm. world of the performance, um, I'm responsible. I sort of uh, manage those people, the people who do that. And really what my job is, is uh, I'm kind of a go-between between, between the artistic team for the project and the technical team. So I 
take the image and the vision of the artists, the designers and the director, and I make their picture in their head happen on our stage, or at least I try to, I get as close as possible. So I'm really sort of a conduit between that. I'm an implementer. Um, and I have a lot of, mostly I rely on the folks who work in the departments I supervise as subject matter experts to really support that process. But I'm the, the go-between conduit. Does that make sense? Right. So you're sort of the, the person that takes the concept and make it reality. A little bit, yeah, yeah. Well, I want to uh, welcome everyone who's coming into this Zoom chat right now. Um, and to also let you know that uh, I think throughout the city, the internet has been a little glitchy. So um, be patient with us as we work through some of the technical difficulties in this digital world that we now find ourselves living and working in. And um, I'm talking with Russ Crosby, our technical director at Seattle Opera. And I'm Glenn Hare, and I'm the senior communications manager at Seattle Opera. Um, as we move forward, um, now in the perfect world, Ross, I think that everything would go quite smoothly. The sets would come in on time, the load-in would happen without a glitch, and uh, you know, two or three days later, everything's perfect, the dress rehearsals happen, and then there's a perfect performance run. Uh, but in the real world, um, is that the case most often, or do you come into challenges and obstacles? Yeah, um, well, I would say, let's talk, can we talk a little bit about the process and then sure. get there? Does that make sense? Sure. So on a typical, so, I mean, opera theater, I think, really, there's so many people involved in producing an opera. It takes... I mean, there's so many different people and so many different departments and different sort of stakeholders from orchestra to your main singers to the chorus. Um, and then there's all the things that happen backstage. And then there are the design teams and the director and costumes and makeup. And then after you get all of these elements that need to sort of fall in place and work together to create the beautiful final product, and then once you get all those elements together, you need somebody to tell us all when to go on stage at the right time and when to go off stage and how things need to work together. Just somebody who's in charge of making sure that we're all safe and everything, this sort of artistic vision, like the picture is executed properly. And that, that sort of work group is the stage management work group. So there are just so many different pieces and parts that need to work together to create the picture. Um, and so we all have to sort of manage our own section. And my section um, is, like I said, the, the scenic, the set, the lights, the props, that kind of stuff, the technical elements. And so when we get to the beginning, like when we first start planning something, what I do is I sit down and I get all the information that I can about a production. Um, what, if it's been produced before somewhere else, um, I'll get all of their previous running work, I'll get photos of the show, and I'll take um, plans like uh, scaled blueprints of what the set looks like, and I'll look and see there are often archive videos and photos, and I compile all of this information so I can sort of wrap my brain around what is this play, like what is this picture, what is this world, how are we going to make this happen, and then I have to figure out what would it look like for us to take these pieces and parts and put them in our stage, in our theater, in McCaw Hall. So once I get all of the pieces and the, the information, I take and I make our own set of blueprints. I take all mm. of them and put it down in a, in a blueprint, a scale drawing of McCaw Hall. And I check to make sure, first and foremost, that everybody who's sitting in the theater is able to see what they need to see, see all, this, all the entrances and all the exits and make sure they can see where the, the neat scenic tricks are going to happen. Um, and if they can't, then we make adjustments to the set and the lights and everything else before we get into the theater so we can make sure that it'll work. So that's the first thing, it's called a sightline study. That's the very first part. And then I look at what needs to happen. Like for Rigoletto, sometimes there are things that move up and down and fly in and out for scene changes. Uh, sometimes there are special effects. 
sometimes there are um, uh, video, like complicated video elements. So I look at all the different elements and I try and figure out how we're going to execute that in our space. What mm -hmm. resources do we need and what is the best, best way forward? So I put together, I try and answer all of those questions and I put together a package of paperwork that will hopefully communicate to the other members, the other stakeholders, the other folks who are working on the project, what my idea and what the plan is for how we can make these technical elements work in our theater. And then I sit down and I have a meeting. I have a meeting with the stage manager who's in charge of pretty much the stage operations and moving, you know, executing the, once we get into the theater and she manages the rehearsal process. And then I talk to my department heads, the head carpenter and the head electrician and the head prop person. And I, put the, I share the details of my idea, my plan, so that they can look at it. And then we all talk about it and we refine the plan. We've, they help me come up with more efficient ways to do it or better ways to do it. Um, or they come up with things that I didn't think about and they share that and then I go back and we all refine the plan. And that, that is usually what happened. That, that part where we're all refining and figuring out um, what the next step is, that's usually the first day of rehearsal. In my time at Seattle Opera, typically we will rehearse two, two and a half weeks um, before we start to um, go into the theater at McCaw Hall. So several months of planning and working on putting things together and making sure we have paperwork and we all know what's gonna happen and getting everybody on the same page and we have meetings and meetings and meetings, like three or four meetings over the course of that process to make sure that we are making the cleanest, most efficient, sort of easiest plan to make everything work. And then we get into the theater and then there's the first day of the load-in. And the first day of the load-in is when we take all of the set pieces and all of the lights and all of the audio equipment and all of the video things and we have sometimes 50, 70 people all on wow. the technical department that converge onto the um, that converge onto the stage and we set everything up. We set up the set, we set it, we put up the lights, we make sure everything works and we point it all at the stage. And that process takes about three days and they're usually 12 hour days. Mm. How do you keep folks from not running into each other? Is there some kind of choreography to the load in? There's definitely, um, you know, there's definitely a, a, an order that we, a, an order of operations. Okay. So not so much, I mean, we have to be careful not to run into each other, not to be aware of, of our surroundings, but I think um, uh, there are more efficient ways to, to um, put things in place. Mm -hmm. so it's sort of like, um, it's sort of like, uh, it, like if you're, um, if you're walking, you want to make sure that you don't put things in your path mm -hmm. and, and in the right order so that they can, um, it's like when you're putting on your clothes, you don't put on your pants before you put on your underwear, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, um, the load-in happens and I then, oh, I think we may have a small glitch here. Ross, could you repeat yourself? Um, I said, uh, so the load-in happens, and then after the three days, usually three days of load-in, we try to get everything set up so that it looks exactly the way we think that the designers and the directors thought it would look in their head. Mm -hmm. Get it as close as possible. This is sort of, we're presenting them with what we think is what it needs to be. What they said they wanted, this is what we're giving them. And then that's when the stage manager and the design team and the director come into McCaw Hall first thing in the morning and we all gather on stage and it's everybody who's involved in the production. We've got all, well, all of the technical people um, and then the design people all converge together on the, on the stage. And that is what we call show and tell. And that's oh. a day, that morning, everybody, we all set up all of the different scenes and looks of the show. Um, and we page through it and the design team and the director get to look at it in real time, in real one-to-one -one scale. And then they get to decide, hmm, 
that's perfect. It's exactly what I had in my mind. And sometimes they look at it and they think, that's nothing like what I thought it would be. <laughs> because it's never exactly, like, it's hard to imagine what something will look like just from looking at a piece of paper that scale. So when we get to the theater, that's our opportunity. That show and tell period, it's about two, two and a half hours. And we go through all the different looks. And that's when we find out how close we got to what was in their head. And if we miss what was in their head, we have to figure out how we're going to get closer to it. Right. And that part is, that's, that's, a, that's the crux of my role. So then I'm outside listening to our design and artistic team and our stage management team about like, is this close? Did we get it? What are we missing? And then I sort of figure out, work with our, my department heads uh, to figure out if we missed it, how do we get closer? And more importantly, what is that gonna cost? And what's the best? <laughs> right. So do you want to show us some examples? Um, of, of final product, you mean, of sets that are? Yeah, I think maybe we wanted to share some um, examples of like Steve Jobs or Rigoletto and uh, some other recent performances in McCall Hall. Yeah, well, I've got, um, so the thing I, I pitched, of course, was, you know, sometimes things don't go as planned. Right. So I could tell you some stories. Um, I guess we'd started off with um, Steve Jobs, because that was okay. the So Steve Jobs was my, really my first production that I was the technical director for here at Seattle Opera. Um, and I'll tell you, I, you know, I've been, by the time I took this position, I'd worked in, in, the, I'd worked in technical theater and production for uh, many years. I started, I was working in New York in 2000, from 2000 to 2004, and this was 2019, so almost 20 years. And but it's still hard. It's hard to. It was my first production here, and uh, I was still learning sort of the ins and outs of the opera and how you know what your process was. And I only had about a month. I came in really most of the work mm -hmm. was the prep work had been done, so I was still trying to catch up and also learn people's names and you know all of that. So. I was really hoping that this project, I saw the set for Steve Jobs. Caroline, why don't you, um, maybe we could show the, the images for Steve Jobs. I don't know if any of you saw this production, but the set was really simple. It was just this, there was a, a roof piece, a header piece that, that covered the top of the stage. And there were these six rectangular objects that rolled around the stage. And that was pretty much it. And I thought, well, that's not so bad. That's not too bad of a, a project to start off with. And you can see, I think these, those are four of the six um, rectangular, we called them uh, monoliths is what mm -hmm. we, so I'll call them that. Um, and then there was some video elements and the video elements were um, all of the images on those monoliths are video projection. Um, and that was actually quite complicated. Um, but we had a projection coordinator who was uh, working on the production. So he and I worked together closely on it because I hadn't been part of the early, early planning stages and all of those details seemed to be well in hand. And, and so I, I felt pretty confident that Steve Jobs' first production was gonna be a nice, easy transition. And then I don't know if you remember, but in February of 2019, there was a blizzard that hit Seattle. <laughs> uh, and, and that blizzard happened to coincide with the week before we were supposed to load in Steve Jobs. And what that meant for us, for our department, was that we had to cancel a number of rehearsals for the artists. So the schedule got shifted dramatically. And on top of that, almost all of the deliveries that we were expecting for our rental gear were delayed if not canceled. So we usually spend the week before we go load in as a really intensive time of preparing and making sure that all of the instruments and the equipment that we're gonna use is ready and working and make sure that, you know, everybody, all of the, so, you know, all of the assistants and the um, other people that we're gonna hire on for the project, sort of over hire people up for that we might hire on for the project are 
informed about what the plan is and we're working and we just very busy and we get everything just ready to just slide right in so we can meet that three day window, that deadline. Mm -hmm. But this time, the week before, we most people couldn't be there and the people that could show up didn't have as much work to do because they the equipment that we needed for this really complicated video project wasn't there. Mm. So that was a little stressful, but it was fine. We figured it out. Like the day before load in, all of the equipment arrived and all of the video people were there and they had they had planned, they were ready and, and it's a really efficient, really talented group. And they all jumped in and they got it all prepped and they thought it was gonna be fine. We started loading in. And again, the set, really relatively simple, no problem, that went up, no problem, we're fine, everything was located. And we started setting up all the video and two of the elements, two of the pieces didn't work. Mm. So, okay, that shouldn't be that big of a deal, right? We could probably just replace them. I mean, we actually ordered extras, but the, the pieces didn't work. And so, that was, a that was a little stressful, but that was fine. We called our vendor. They said, no problem, we'll overnight you the replacement parts. Okay, so they overnighted the replacement parts. In the meantime, you know, we're, pro we're progressing and we go in and we have show and tell and then all of the artists people are looking at it and saying, yes, 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 this looks fabulous, but we really wanna see the video because we can't know if it's gonna work. I don't know, if you saw Steve Jobs, the show was really all about the video. Yeah. If you don't have the video, it really just like big white blocks moving around. <laughs> that is not impressive. No, not at all. And we want it to be impressive, especially if you're the new technical director for the Seattle. <laughs> you're really aiming for impressive. Do you know what I'm saying? So, <laughs> um, so then I was like, okay, fine. So I'm like, don't worry, everybody. We're getting the replacement parts. So. The next day came and we got the replacement parts and we happened to also have, because this is such a complicated show and the video elements were new and um, we had a representative from the, uh, the rental company that we got the equipment from who was there and he was an expert on the program and he was going to support us while we did it. And it was so great. It was going to be great. So we got these replacement pieces, we replaced the parts and then it still didn't work. Oh my goodness. Yeah, so now I'm kind of, I'm like, I'm starting to, I'm starting to feel concerned, right? <laughs> we replace the parts and it still doesn't work. And then the representative from the rental company is like, oh, we got a new theory. Actually, we think it's actually not that. We think what's going on is uh, there, there were these um, beacons that are, so the way that Steve Drum's video worked, those big monoliths had these little receivers in them, basically. Oh, wow receivers are um, were communicating wirelessly to a separate system that was basically sending information to the projectors to let them know where they should focus their lights so that right. you got the effect of the thing would move and the image just traveled with the 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 monolith and apparently there was the the receivers for those there were two of them that were not working and they were broken and I was like okay so we need to get two of those, we need to replace those. Can you overnight those? And they said, well, we don't have any more of those. Oh, no. And I said, well, I mean, okay. So, so then what do we do? I mean, what do you mean that you don't have any more of those? It's like, well, we don't, we just don't have any more of those. I was like, well, someone has to have more of them, right? So, so we just need to find them. I mean, it's a big country, certainly. <laughs> it is a big country. <laughs> right? And so, uh, so at this, you know, and I'm talking to the guy and he's like, well, let me call my, we'll see what we can do. We'll see what we can do. I was like, okay, great. You know, perfectly fine, confident that it'll be solved. So um, we sit back down and then um, I get later that day, I hear, I, I got talked to the guy. He's like, okay, we found two more and they're in Texas. And I said, great. Um, and he's like, but, um, they're not able to send them to us until tomorrow, which happened to be, I can't remember the exact days, but whatever day they were gonna send them to us, they were gonna overnight them that day and it, they were not gonna be able to be delivered until the following Monday, which happened to be a holiday. Oh. 
Yeah. Like, okay. Well, the complicated thing about having something delivered on a holiday to the opera center is that there's no one at the opera center on a holiday. It was, I think it was, um, what's the president's day? It was president's day. Well, no one was going to be there on president's day. We can't receive a delivery on president's day at the opera center. And I said, no problem. You just have them send it to my house. But you see, <laughs> I was concerned because I feel like when you make a change halfway through something, it doesn't always track through. You know what I mean? It's sort of like you make a request over on the online system and they yeah. say, no problem, we'll send it to you. But if you're doing something funny, like changing an address or something, sometimes it doesn't go through. So I said, I want to talk to the person who's going to mail this and let them know that the address is changing because it needs to come to my house. It has to come to my house because no one will be at the opera center. Right. The process, you might imagine, took about an hour and a half. But I managed to talk to the guy in Texas, and he said, don't worry about it, man. I got you. And he repeated back my address. So, <laughs> so that was, you know, I, I think that was whatever day that was. I was like, great, letting it, not worried about a thing. My friend in Texas would not let me down. And then it got to be, it was supposed to come to my house by I think 10 o'clock that, on, on that holiday, right? And I waited and I waited and it was now 10.30. And see, now I've lost confidence in my friend from Texas because I don't think it's coming. So I call the FedEx company and I say, hi, I'm Ross Crosby. I'm tracking this thing for Seattle Opera. And they said, oh no, that actually was, was we tried to deliver that to the Opera Center but no one was there. And I said, no, no, it should have come to me. <laughs> anyway, so I'm, they were like, okay, well, don't worry, you can go pick it up at the FedEx facility. And I said, great. Um, but the thing about it was, is that it wasn't sent to me. I'm Russ Crosby, but it had somebody else's name. It had our projection coordinator's name on it because he was the one who was managing all the rentals. So then I couldn't pick it up at the <laughs> FedEx facility. I mean, it's such a comedy of errors. Like, I was just, and, and it, all for the one of these two little pieces that we're going to make it so that we could have video, which I've been promising the artistic team now for three days <laughs> because things kept breaking. You know what I mean? Yeah. Then I was in the position where I went down to the FedEx facility and I'm, I'm trying to have a rational conversation with the person standing behind the FedEx counter where I'm saying, really? You have to, you just simply have to give me this package. I cannot wait until tomorrow. Tomorrow will be too late. And, you know, it doesn't make sense if you're talking to someone at the post office. A day or four hours would make a difference about one package. But for us, like, if we didn't have it for 8.30 in the morning the next morning, we weren't gonna be able to have time to install it in time for rehearsal that night. And it just, there was a cascade of problems that it was gonna cause. So anyway, needless to say, I did manage to talk the guy into giving me the package. We did have the equipment we needed and we were in fact able to implement it. And by the time we got to opening night, the video was working fine and everybody was delighted and, it, and <sighs> the artistic team was thrilled. But that's just one of the, uh, that was one of the, one of the sort of bloopers, backstage bloopers for. My goodness, that's more drama than the opera had in it. <laughs> oh, goodness gracious. So you've, you've said that you were pretty cool, but level-headed and calm the whole time. But to be honest, were there moments when you just thought you would just scream your head off or pull your hair out or... I don't know. Well, fortunately, I don't have much hair to pull on, so that. <laughs> you know, um, actually, I mean, it's a good question. I, I think the thing about it, um, and especially because I was new at the opera, I, it was a great bonding experience because I got the opportunity to, uh, the thing, I, I got the opportunity to really problem solve and work with this group of people who are exceptionally competent and exceptionally creative. And um, really willing to like keep working a problem to find a solution. You know, I, I like to say um, that in particular in, a, in my work group, this is true, and I think it's probably true across the opera. Like it's, it's easy to identify a problem, 
but solving a problem like is it, it is is like a real team sport and mm -hmm. a lot of really great problem solvers um on our team i think and so and 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 um so i feel really grateful and that was really it was a nice opportunity for my team to get to know me and i could you know share that i was on their side like oh yeah to work this problem how can how can i what's my role in solving it and i got an opportunity to watch them really shine and do their thing well i want to thank our donors for tuning into this um live streaming opportunity here again without your support even the little things like this that we're doing to share the inside knowledge of seattle opera would not be possible so again thank you so much um ross uh You've talked about Steve Jobs and how it was a simple set, but Rigoletto was a totally different type of production. I mean, you had huge set pieces. I remember clearly that large chandelier hanging um, mm -hmm. um, in the middle of the set. Tell us a little bit about how that production came together. That was a fun show. Um, so the interesting, so the interesting thing about Rigoletto is, um, and Caroline, maybe can you show the photo of the Rigoletto set so we can we can see. All right. So for I'm, for folks who um, saw Rigoletto, hopefully this will ring a bell. But if, if you didn't see it, what it um, it was the Act One and Act Three. The big portions of the opera took place in the palace. And there was, this was a production that we rented from uh, New Zealand Opera. Uh, so it traveled quite a ways to be with us. Um, and it pro primarily took, there was this big three-sided, huge, shiny black palace wall and a big crystal chandelier that hung in the middle. And all of that as part of the, uh, it started off at the beginning of the opera where that palace wall was um, sort of flown half halfway in, so not on the floor and not all the way out, so you can still see it. And then it came, it, it slowly descended on the way to the deck. And then at some portion during the first act, it slowly descended out and then back in. Um, thanks, Carolyn. Um, so that was uh, an example of sort of a more comp, one of the more complicated automation uh, moves that we've had in the last couple of years anyway. Um, and so there are a few things that made that complicated. One is that because we didn't produce that show, we rented it. Um, when we rent a production, we rely really heavily on the company that uh, we're renting it from to give us, provide us with detailed information about the production. And for this particular production, New Zealand didn't have a lot of um, really detailed information about it. Um, we had very often, usually we end up, we get scaled drawings um, in an electronic form, uh, like electronic blueprints and things like that for scenery. We get really detailed um, running paperwork that shows what, what the sets, what the different looks, what the different acts in the set looks like. There's usually inventories of what we're getting. In this particular case, the information was very, very scant and um, mostly it wasn't in scale at all. So I ended up drawing a lot of things electronically to scale based on the set it arrived from New Zealand. Um, so one of the things that um, was a challenge for that production was that the wall is extremely heavy. It mm -hmm. was, um, uh, gosh, I'm trying to remember. I want to say it was, I want to say it was 67,000 or 6,700 pounds, which is, wow pretty significant weight for us, especially with the, all of the movement that it does. Um, and so we had to figure out the best way to move that piece. The other challenge we had with moving it um, is that uh, it moved what we call a vista, which means it moved while you were sitting in the house, you could see it move, which means you can't use chain motors uh, because they make a loud clack, 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 clack sound. <laughs> Um, add an air of excitement and wonder. It, in fact, draws away your attention. Um, so we used an automated winch-driven system that we have in-house. In but 
what really seems relatively simple. You go in and you sit down in the theater and you see this wall, this whole palace wall and a chandelier move and it's amazing. And you think, gosh, it's amazing. How did they make that wall and the chandelier move? But that was not the only thing that had to move because that set was, it was, it was narrow enough that the wall and the chandelier needed to move. But also we had lighting positions, we had cable runs, like everything. There was so much that needed to move at the same time that that palace moved. We had 17 different, what I'm gonna call line sets, with 17 different independent items that all had to move concurrently at the same place just for that thing to happen. So figuring out the logistics of that took some time, you can imagine. Right. So we did that. We planned it all out. We figured out all the logistics. How is it going to move? Who's going to do what? What parts are going to be run by humans? And what parts are going to be run by the automated system? We planned it out. We made it work. And then we got into the theater. And we sat down. And remembering that we didn't have a lot of great documentation about what this looked like. And we sat down with the um, director and the uh, designer. And we started in show and tell. And we showed them. And we moved this magic. It was beautiful moved it magically all the way out. And the production designer said, oh, that's not what happens there. That's not how that moves. <laughs> like, oh, really? Goodness. And he's like, yeah, no. Um, and it turned out different things needed to move at different times, which wow. is really not a big deal because in theater, oftentimes we set things up so that everything can have the maximum amount of flexibility. But in this particular case, because the um, wall was that three three sided wall moving things in different order was we just hadn't set it up for that level of flexibility um so that required some rethinking and some uh sort of quick on your feet planning about how to deal with it uh, again, that's something that um like we have a great i mean uh, uh, the partnership that we have or i have with the rest of the teammate is uh, the team is fantastic um I think really creative problem solvers. So we were able to do it and we were able to uh, sort of give them exactly what they wanted within, the, within not too much time. So that was nice. That's amazing. Yeah. So what, was, what was the change? You started with everything moved at one time, but then were different pieces to move separately and independently? Yeah, so we started off with everything moving at the same time, um, but what ended up happening was the there were two downstage video screens uh, that we had hung uh, right. of the original production. And earlier when I was talking about the prep work that we do, we had those downstage, uh, the down in the front two video screens showing because uh, you may remember in, the, in that palace, there was a big screen television that they had, uh, that they showed video content on. Well, because of the sight lines, the, the places that people sit in our audience, um, there were a significant number of the people who, in the audience, who weren't gonna be able to see that video screen. Right. So the way we solved that was by adding these, these two video screens downstage um, that would display the content for people to see who were not able to see the video content that was displayed on the, on the um, palace wall. So that um, was an additional item and so because they had an additional, I like to say that if they get a new toy to play with that means they want to play with it and have it do different things. <laughs> so, um, uh, that, that was part of it. That was up and down depending and, and it really I think ultimately having things move at different places and in different directions really added some dimensionality to those movements. Well, certainly the, uh, the, the opportunity to play with a new element always leads to um, excitement and anticipation. Uh, and those two big video screens, if I remember correctly, um, really immersed you into the, the moment in the opera, I believe it was election night and they were looking at the live broadcast. And so it really placed you in the moment. Um, Recently, we just had Charlie Parker's Yardbird, and um, I was particularly thrilled to um, see that production come together as a huge jazz fan. 
I was absolutely amazed at the, the visual elements of the jazz musicians that were in the lettering from Duke Ellington and Miles Davis to Billie Holiday, um, Chet Baker. Uh, and so tell us a little bit about that particular production. Again, it was a minimal setting, just basically mm -hmm. tables and chairs for the most part. But that mm -hmm. visual element behind was certainly stunning. Yeah, I think that was a really interesting production to be a part of. And certainly it was our most recent one. Really beautiful content. Um, and the uh, it was a rented production. We rented that from uh, Opera Philadelphia. And uh, Ron Daniels and the rest of the, Ron Daniels was the uh, director for that production. And he was fantastic to work with very, very involved, um, very involved director uh, and collaborator. So what we um, what we uh, it's interesting. So Yardbird was a, a like you said a really minimal set, and their concept was that they really wanted to see the elements of the theater, the backstage, and they wanted to like make it feel like you were in really sitting in a jazz club or could mm -hmm. inside a jazz club, and so. There were you. There was exposed truss for the lighting positions, and you could see all of the what I, the pipes that were overhead where you hung lighting instruments, and it was like you say, very very minimal. Um, and so, one of the challenges of having a set like that, where the concept is to see the theater around you, is that the presentation. Oh, there's the image. So there there are these letters, and you can see the lights and the pipes up there. One of the, there's a temptation, I think to think, oh, it'll be fine. We'll just, we'll just look at the theater. We don't need to worry about sort of too much masking or too much scenery or too much anything. We'll just, we just wanna see the actual theater. But the truth is, um, nobody really wants to see the actual theater. Like you don't wanna see, I mean, it, it, there's an idea, an image in, in one's head um, when, Imagine what backstage looks like, and that's really the visual element that people want. So one of the challenges is how can we make our theater look and feel like the idea of what a theater might be when you don't have a lot of scenic elements to work with. So um, uh, in this particular uh, production, uh, it was, we had to make sure that all of our cable, all the um, cable that we used to plug in all the lighting instruments was dressed very, very cleanly and very perfectly. Um, and we had to uh, make sure that any of the elements, all those letters that flew in and out, um, all of them needed to have uh, a pipe that all of the pipes trimmed out at exactly the same height, which um, which meant that uh, we, we needed to make sure that all of the it, all of the things that we had um, that we would normally have that that um, are not part of the sh the production needed to be in in view. I'm sorry, I just uh, no. I think I understand what you're saying. It's sort of like um, when you uh, clean your garage or something. You know, you might have guests coming over uh, and all of you want to tidy it up, but behind the tidiness is chaos. So what you're right. doing is dressing the chaos, all of the stuff that you don't want people to see in a way that makes it look nice. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's like um, you, there's, you want people to see a working theater, but you don't want them to see an actual working theater. Right, exactly. You want it to look effortless. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We had, um, and it was interesting too, because the Yardbird was also um, the show that we were, we had our gala at the same time. So yeah. An extra layer of equipment and infrastructure that typically we would just add into the regular like lighting, we would add lights onto whatever the show lights were for our gala to make sure that we had lights for that. But we couldn't do that on this on this show because every element, every single technical piece, all the equipment was part of a visual. Mm. So it was a real um, it was a real challenge um, and an interesting challenge to to uh, sort of thread the needle or needle the thread. 
Right. So I believe if I'm remembering correctly, there was a production the was it the day before the gala or but you really had to turn the stage into a mm. banquet hall yeah with very little turnaround time yeah that was fun it it actually um, it, it we had a couple days we had a performance and then we had a day to right changeover before, to get to the gala but we had the gala on saturday was it saturday right carolyn I think it was Friday. It was Friday. It was Friday. Friday. That's yeah. right. We had the gala on Friday night, and then um, we had a performance the next er, the next day, and yeah. we had five hours between. We had five hours to take the whole gala setup and completely turn it around back into our um, set and get it ready for the production, which was quite a quite a trick and quite a thing to figure out. That was that was really fun. One of the it was a great party. The, the gala was a great party, but I'm just amazed at the amount of teamwork and energy that went in to convert it from an opera to a gala back to an opera. Now that's some, that's some real teamwork and some real um, camaraderie going on there with various people um, doing various things all at the same time and really hitting the mark each time. Yeah, it was, it's a, it's a lot of teamwork and it's a lot of, it really is an opportunity for all of us to come together and figure out how to make something work. You know, we all really, um, the galas are, the uh, big opera party is a really special um, event for us to be a part of in the technical department. You know, we really want, you know, we all really want to support the opera and, and it's mm -hmm. our opportunity to really get to play and um, make, use our skills to support the vision of, you know, the different, the, the company at large. Um, mm -hmm. and that we can sort of uh, co, you know, there's a lot more collaboration between the across departments in the opera on that party. Um, instead of having us all sort of, not sequestered, but you know, sort of focused. Right, in our, in our, in our own tunnels. Yeah, exactly. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about, um, the props in Charlie Parker's Yardbird. Um, I uh, was particularly interested in the old fashioned uh, wheelchair. I'm mm. curious to find out, did we have that in our props collection? Oh, yeah, there's, there's a couple of fun stories about the props for Charlie Parker's Yardbird. So um, one is about the wheelchair. There, that, there was supposed to be a wheelchair, like 1930s wheelchair, that came with the production, um, but it didn't come. I called, um, it, was, it was on the inventory and I ended up calling uh, my, my counterpart in Philadelphia and asking him, I was like, hey, we didn't get the wheelchair, what's the story there? And he was like, oh geez, let me see, I can go look into it. Turns out the last place, the previous company that rented that performance or production was in London and the London company saved the, kept the wheelchair and didn't send it back. So, um, not only did we not have the wheelchair, it was in London and we were certainly not going to get it in time. So um, that meant we had to find, and we didn't realize this until maybe uh, a week before rehearsal was going to start. So we were in a position to try and figure out like, ah, how are we going to get a wheelchair that's the right period? And, mm -hmm. um, and we have a, a prop, our prop, I contacted our prop head, Hannah, and I said, oh man, what are we going to do? Uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> a lot of money to spend on this honestly, um, which is usually having money is a, one way to solve a problem. But we didn't have a lot of that. So uh, I said, what are we going to do? And she said, oh my goodness, you're not going to believe this, but I just got, she'd just gotten a call, an email from a person who had a storage facility, that storage locker that she was cleaning out. And she's like, oh, is there any chance you're interested in any of this stuff? And she snapped pictures of all this sort of bizarre mix of, of items that this person had in storage that was looking to give away. And you, would you believe one of them was a 1930s wheelchair? Uh, I believe it now. And I was like, well, that is amazing. And I would like to have that. Yes, please. <laughs> and, <laughs> and so that's how we ended up with the wheelchair is this um, random connection who uh, was able to help us and, and um, it worked out great. And another thing, here's, I'd forgotten about this, but um, 
so for Charlie Parker's yard work, there's a, a body, a, a, yep. a, yeah, in as part of that scene or at that production, and uh, there the image, the head of of that body that uh, uh, was was actually the face of our Charlie Parker. Um, you know the per the performer. The performers, yes. Yeah, and we had two different uh, singers uh, perform Charlie uh, on alternating nights, and so that was an interesting project because um, initially, in the early in the early early planning, in the in sort of perform the production meetings that we were having, um, one of the members of the artistic team said to me, "Oh, you know what? I think the director is going to want that." the actual face of, of our singers to be on that, on that dead body. And I was like, oh, really? Are you sure? And she was like, yeah, I think he's gonna. And I was like, all right, well, let me go check. So I emailed the director and I said, oh, Russ Crosby did an introduction, shared with him some of our plans and what have you. And I said, oh, by the way, I, are you, like, do you want, or is your intention to have the image of our performer as the head of those, um, that body and he was like oh yes that's exactly what I would like please and I thought oh, <laughs> okay yeah. um, how are we gonna do that so this was a great collaboration between uh, Susan Davis who I think has done one of these uh, maybe or might in the future she's the costume director and I contacted Susan my colleague and sat down with her in her office and thought what are we gonna do how are we gonna make this happen because I was trying to make it a hair and makeup problem and not uh, tech problem but um, what she uh, she was phenomenal so I worked with her and her team and they identified uh, that act theater uh, somebody at act theater has a 3d scanner and a 3d print. Wow. so what we did is we worked in great collaboration between the craft department and the costume shop and the tech department uh, the prop department where um, Susan and her crew in, in costumes uh, contacted our colleague at Axe Theater, and we did a test uh, prototype version. One of our, our, our staff went down there and had her face scanned, and then they made a 3D model of her face, and we looked at it, and we said, okay, I think this can work. And we learned some things about what kind of um, detail and um, uh, we were gonna need, and then, um, uh, we talked to the prop department about what are the best ways to attach this head because we ended up needed we needed to remove the head that was there and then figure out a way to attach ours and so that we could easily remove one and put the other back the other one on. alternating performances so um, it was I think it was a great collaboration and um, it was slick it was easy because um, one way to do that sort of the um, more traditional way to do that would be to take a, a Cast the yeah. performer's face mm -hmm. and then cast from that mold and then it would be a lot of painting and a lot mm -hmm. of and this particular production we just didn't have a lot of money and mold taking that's a lot of time for the singers and it's a lot of labor for our staff and it just it was not something that we could really easily fit in the budget so this worked out to be a really great solution um, and a really great collaboration uh, internally so well, you'd never know when an angel's hand is going to come in and help out. Either you'll find it in a warehouse someplace across town or just a block up the street where someone's got a, a 3D scanner. We've got a question here um, from uh, one of our viewers wanting to know, are, are there any particular challenges that you are anticipating um, in any of next year's productions that you sort of had a chance to, to think about and to mull over? Yeah, I mean, right now I'm just really hopeful that we'll get to produce. Um, <laughs> sincere hope. Um, yeah, fingers uh, crossed there for sure. Yeah, um, I'm really, I, I, I feel optimistic about it. Um, I will say, so one of the challenges that I, uh, I know that uh, Calf Pag is our next production. It's supposed to be our production to kick off our season. Uh, that's going to be a really fun show. There's going to be uh, some flying. We're going to have some singers that are flying. Uh, and we're going to get to drag out our some of our uh, track and some of the hardware that we had for the ring. So that'll be mm -hmm. fun. It's not going to be the same flying that we had in the ring, but it'll be still fun uh, to to have that as uh, part of the performance. There's going to be some 
spot fire special effects that I'm looking forward to that for CAD PAG. Um, and then <clears throat> in January, um, we're also uh, uh, having a production of, uh, we're planning to do a production of Don Giovanni, which is gonna have some, a turntable. We've got a couple turntable projects coming up. Uh, Rigoletto had a turntable in it, and uh, the next few shows we've got, I think Cap Pag has a turntable, and uh, Don Giovanni will have a turntable. So we've got some automation stuff, which is giving an opportunity to really sort of do some maintenance and uh, upgrade some of our, hopefully we'll be an opportunity to upgrade some of our auto uh, infrastructure. Uh, so, cause I think uh, it will be great to do that. I think looking ahead at some of the future seasons that Ms. Shuffleman has in mind, I think automation is gonna play a bigger, uh, much bigger role in some of the work that we do, hopefully. Well, Russ, I certainly wanna take this opportunity to thank you. Um, I also want to thank all of our viewers this afternoon. It was wonderful to have you all here. Um, next week, uh, we will have Susan Davis as our on-screen guest. Um, as Russ mentioned, she's the director of our costuming department and has wonderful tales to share about what happens in her area from uh, original sketches to building uh, wigs, uh, makeup, uh, all the accessories that go into costuming. So that should be very, very interesting. And lastly, I'd like to thank you, our donors and subscribers for um, helping us do what we love to do. And that is to share this great, great art form with the community and to bring us all together. And we are certainly looking forward to that chance when we can do that again. So again, thank you, thank you so much. And um, have a nice weekend. Thank you. Nice to meet you all. Stay safe and healthy.